Don't put Chucky next to a knife block for the love of God. Like, share, subscribe to the channel, ring that bell below. Meantime, we have something. You will be among the first to know. You know, it's Halloween, we're in the spirit, we're getting a Halloween sequel, uh, we're getting all the random tidbits of Halloween. And, and one thing, the gift that Don Mancini just keeps giving us is that Chucky is never going away. He is literally our friend to the end. And the series Child's Play has been with us since 1988, and it has spawned uh, seven films and some. Some of them theatrical, some of them direct video, and a, and a remake, which we, I don't hate, but we won't talk about because it has nothing to do with anything that Dan Mancini truly wanted to do. This show, Chucky, returns back to its roots and gets back, loses the tech and goes back to that murderous, laughing, foul mouth, uh, Charles B. Ray version of Chucky. Uh, voiced by Brad Dura. The Child's Play series has been sort of a mixed bag. I, uh, the first film is still one of the best uh, horror films ever put. Then it gets sort of um, campy, and then it gets comedy, which you can go either way with, if you like your your craziness with Steve of Chucky and, and all of that stuff. It, it gets a little nutty. <laughs> but then we get uh, Cult and Curse of Chucky in direct video, which sort of return back to the roots of the first one to become more of a horror film, and are actually really well done. Uh, I know not, not as many people who have not sort of follow along with Don Mancini and his, his trajectory of Chucky and Child's Play are aware of those films, but if you haven't, you should check those out. Uh, probably, possibly because they are sort of in canon and fit in with whatever we get with this series, which at the top of the show is a little hard to decipher uh, because at the end of Cult of Chucky, Chucky was in a bad way. His head was getting tortured. So it's going to take this, this, this series to do a little bit of legwork to explain to us how there's a Charles Lee Ray possessed version of a good guy now that is back in full form, looking fine, and at a, a garage sale. And that's where this episode begins. Chucky, this poor woman has no idea what she has there. Her, her daughter, which probably will come back to light as explaining where specifically she came, he came from, but her daughter had a doll. She just gave it away at his garage sale and whatever. She's like, ah, this means nothing to me. It's vintage or retro, how much you want for it. She mistakenly puts it by a, a knife block, which immediately had me thinking like, well shit, this is gonna go terribly wrong. Like no matter where he goes or what happens for the rest of this episode, Chuck is already armed. You guys got, didn't even make it hard on him. He's just like, ah, thanks, cool. So this young man named Jake uh, finds the doll and uh, buys it for 10 bucks and did not realize that his life would be forever changed. This episode's sort of a mixed bag for me. All in all, I enjoy it, but there are some things that, this is an episode that's trying to establish tone and characters. And so for a lot of the characters are high school kids and uh, it becomes very Saturday morning. If anyone's around, if anyone's born in those 90s, it becomes very Saturday morning uh, drama or Saturday morning teen angst. And so people are bullying and, and and there's some there's some a lot of gay bashing uh and so the stuff that's happening at the school sometimes doesn't quite work for me because it's setting up a tone uh, but there is a payoff for it and why it works uh i'll get to in a second but jake our lead character who's sort of our taking the place of our andy from the young from those of you are only familiar with from the young the young stuff um jake's a tortured kid he has lost his mom his dad is a drunk uh, who seems to take a lot of issues with his son being both an artist and and gay. Played by Devon Sawa, who is interesting, because if anybody knows Devon Sawa, I'm, I am old enough to know that Devon Sawa was our lead in Final Destination, so it all comes full circle that we are old enough to see Devon Sawa playing uh, an adult, two adults, to a, a, young, a young child. Yeah. You stay in this, these horror games long enough, you stay in these movie games long enough, you start feeling aged real quick. There's a cool thing that is with this episode and with this series is that they've sort of meta ed the world and uh, horror podcasts and people's obsession with crime, 
crime podcast is is at a high. And so there's a kid at the school who is a horror podcast person, somebody who that Jake does have a crush on. But in that podcast, we sort of get the explanation that we're in the town that uh, the original Charles Lee Ray murders took place. So basically, we've come full circle wherever Chucky has been before. It has been reset. He's back now at home. So that leads to an opening and what we get in the tail end of some history of Charles Lee Ray as a kid. We see a scene that looks like there's a, a woman brushing her hair. Uh, and we, we get at the very end of this episode that that is Charles Lee as a kid. And so it looks like throughout this series, we're going to get seeds, no pun intended, we're going to get seeds of Chucky's uh, history and how he got to being Charles Lee the murderer and how Charles Lee then thus got to Chucky. So it looks like some of whatever past was occurring with Charles Lee, in addition to the past that is coming from Chucky, is going to sort of culminate in on this small little town. When we're dealing with the kids and we're dealing with the, the, the adults don't bother me so much. I think when we have that uncomfortable dinner situation where Luke and Lucas Devon Sawa times two, uh, it comes together pretty well because it's establishing the pain that Jake's going through and why he would be in a situation where he is okay with, uh, he's not as against Chucky being foul mouth and a murderer. So Jake is this artist who's made this cool looking but off the wall uh, sculpture of a bunch of old doll head. He's placed them all together and it looks pretty cool. I'm not gonna lie to you, it looks pretty badass. His dad is going through both pain as they've lost their mom and the fact that his son's gay and, and that he will never be anything because art doesn't work to pay for stuff. Um, and he, he, she smashes it all. That sort of sets, sort of sets Jake off. He's a raging alcoholic and some of this is, is brought on because of the alcoholism, some of it's brought on because of the pain of his life, but some of it is because he actually feels this way about his son. Uh, after that's all destroyed, Jake looks online and sort of notices that the good guy doll is a vintage piece and can get a little bit of money for him if he sells him. So he's like, well, I gotta take this to school because I can't leave this in the house. So I do. My dad's probably gonna break this one too. And, I, and if I'm going to try and reestablish this or bring something back, I gotta move it. So he takes it to school, which in itself seems like a bit of an odd thing. Big teenage kid taking a big doll to, to, to school, get on a bus with it. Yeah, you're gonna get teased more. You're already having some issues with being the artist, the, the gay kid. Um, you're gonna get teased even more. It, I mean, for those of you who are old enough to be like me and actually owned a My Buddy doll when they were a kid, imagine taking that with you when you go to your second day of high school. Doesn't seem like the best way to make a lot of friends. And then there's this girl, Lexi, uh, at school, who sort of is the primary bully. And she sort of is the anchor that the rest of the school, she's the popular girl. She's the anchor that the rest of the school sort of follows around. He, she torments him. She takes a photo of him and says that he's poor and here's a GoFundMe to go get these folks off the streets. And he has a photo of him in the home and, 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 uh, and, and Chucky. There is a teacher that comes in and stands up for Chucky and uh, makes puts Lexi on sort of a timeout. Now in this, Jake is giving the teacher the doll to keep in safe safe passage or safe keeping because Chucky won't fit in his locker. And so because Chucky won't fit in the locker because his head's, his head's too damn big, uh, he can't fit in the locker. So she gives him to her and she was like, all right, well cool, I'll keep him. For reasons, that part seems a little odd. I just can't see if a teacher, I know she cares about Jake, but that just seems odd. I, 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 I the only thing that I can harken it to is that she cares so much about him that him being teased is a part of this having a doll. And so if the doll is there or not in his possession, he may get teased less. That's the only way that, that makes sense because I just never could see how a teacher would be like, sure, I'll take your possession and put it over here. A little hard to believe. But the teacher goes and leaves Lexi in the room because she's sort of on timeout while she goes gets another person to sort of verify that she's going to be put in detention. So Ch Lexi and Chucky are put in that room by themselves and, uh, it's the first time you hear that infamous Chucky laugh throughout the entire episode. It sort of sends both a chill up your spine and makes you feel happy because you're like, oh, there he is. There's that foul mouth bastard. And um, other than a stare down, nothing really happens to her except for he does get her phone. Um, but she doesn't care. She just wants to get out there because she feels uncomfortable. Which, in a roundabout way, leads to when this episode is at its highest point. 
I never knew that I wanted a Chucky open mic, but I'm so glad I got one. Uh, so in this episode, there is sort of this talent show or this, this assembly that's happening. All of a sudden, Chucky is sitting behind Jake at the talent show and we get Chucky starting to come, sort of come to life and sort of make himself his presence known. He starts laughing and Jake and Chucky get on stage and sort of do this quote unquote ventriloquist act. But obviously Jake's not handling anything. Chucky's doing it all. Chucky pulls out the phone for Lexi and starts going in. Going in on the school, being foul mouth, telling, telling everybody's business. And I'm not gonna lie to me, it's a damn good time. It's pretty funny. Uh, it's, it's, it's why you, pretty much the prize of why you come to these type of things. Chucky, in addition to being a murderer, is also a very funny and foul mouth and just does not care. And he let her have it. Um, and so in a roundabout way, you don't feel that bad because it's the bully getting their comeuppance. But you know that this is going to, it opens up that door to lead to a world where Chucky is going to start overtaking the balance of what is, what is good and what is not. So, get home and uh, he is in trouble because that, the word of what has happened at the, at the, uh, the assembly has gotten back to his father who is three sheets to the wind and drunk. He's in it. Um, and he takes the doll from him and forces, punches his kid, punches Jake in the nose and sends him upstairs while keeping the doll. I mean, this, you know what happens next. <laughs> um, yeah, he, uh, he gets it, he gets it in a bad way and um, pretty fun death of what happens with Chucky takes a, a bunch of whiskey to the head. He's going to vomit. I'm gonna bomb it good, and it's a fun little death sequence that we get where exposed wires happen, vomit happens, and calamity ensues. It's a good time. Um, it's a it's an inventive death. It's not the typical stab stab. So I, I kind of dug that. But what we get is Jake's dad is not gone, and so what we get is that Chucky has uh, is sort of gonna make himself known to, to Jake, and he does, and he gets to laughing. He's like, "I'm your friend to your end." He becomes more. Uh, we start getting to the point where Chucky gives those facial reactions as opposed to the stoic, uh, everyday Chucky dial face. Chucky's animated and starts showing him, he's like, hey, you're, dude, I'm your friend in the end, we're gonna do this. I, I took out your dad, and he's like, but my dad was a good guy, like, back in the day, before he, all of this happened. He's like, yeah, well, he's died now, he's gone. Um, and he's, uh, Charles Chucky says, uh, hey, what are we gonna do about this Lexi bitch? Uh, and so it, it's clear that that's going to be the next sort of focal point of, of their terror. And you sort of get clips of the, the next previous couple episodes where um, it doesn't seem like Jake's that against Chucky. And it, it's always been a sort of the end of the yang with a lot of the times that Chucky exists. Uh, Andy sort of got to it early because as a kid, he sort of could see them more right and wrong. And his, he, Chucky was immediately hurting people that were he was loving. This one seems a little bit more interesting that Jake is a bit of a more, more of a tormented soul. And he, there's a little bit more anger and hate in his heart. There are a lot of people who have done, done him wrong. And so he does not, from the clips and from what I kind of gathered here with the murder mystery and him being a fan of horror, uh, like those murder podcasts and stuff, he does not seem like the type that is going to be completely dismissive of Chucky. Um, until something happens where he starts going after people that he actually cares about. And it seems like in his circle, there's a lot of people that he doesn't. <laughs> we get to the very end, we see Jake and Chucky being interrogated by the police before uh, Jake's uncle, also played by Devin Sawa, comes to uh, take him home and he is going to reside there in this massive mansion, which gives a lot of space and room for Chucky to do some very foul things. Um, but with the police, uh, they ask him some things. They're sort of, they're not really onto it. They're not really aware, um, but they kind of are like, something's not right here. Something doesn't add up. Jake's got a nose that's sort of busted, but we can't really get into it. Jake says that it wasn't, he failed. Um, but basically, please let him go without any type of, uh, of an issue. Um, I do wonder, because this, this town is as small as it is, um, and this is the birthplace of Charles D. Ray. One thing that is kind of jarring is I'm not entirely sure how no one in this city 
is aware of Chucky um, and with Charles Lee Ray and like the story of like what they what happened in the past. Like I feel like that news would have traveled like somewhere, somebody who would have known about it. And I know you can have online and stuff, but something just seems off that there are so many people, specifically the police department, who are just not aware of things, terrible things happen when that dials around. Um, one thing that I did not bring up is that in the middle of all of this, uh, Jake gets a random call. Can't quite make the voice, but it sounds like it could be Andy um, as an adult, who if you've seen the other two, uh, Colt and Curse of Chucky, you can kind of get there. But he's sort of following the spirit and asks, hey, would this doll refer to himself as Chucky? Check the batteries, give him, give him tips, give him clues, because they're, 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 they're sort of following the breadcrumbs that that doll may be back, or that Charles Lee Ray may be back. And it quickly gets to the point where that's how Jake sort of realized, like, you're Charlie Ray. It's the first time I think we ever get to that revelation that fast. Like, we were off to the race after one episode. We know he's Charlie, like, the, the kid is cognizant that he's Charles Lee Ray, and we're sort of off to the races. So, I mean, all in all, sort of a mixed bag. I think I, uh, it's enjoyable to get another a horror series of a, like, a, a legacy character. Um, I enjoy the open mic night. I enjoyed the, the actual murder and I enjoyed the interaction between Jake and, and Charles and Jake actually and his father are good. When we were doing the, the familial stuff is when this episode's really good. It's just some of the, the child stuff or the, the teen angst high school stuff gets a bit a, a little bit wonky. Although Chucky is eventually going to get a hold of Lexi and when he does it's going to be sweet. It's going to be it's going to be real nice. Uh, but it's going to be weird rooting for a teenage teenager who is a bully. It's going to be weird rooting for a teenager to get, to get murdered. But uh, that is why you're here. It's a horror movie, horror show, and uh, so far, so deal. It doesn't look cheap. It, does, it looks well produced. It looks everything looks good, and it's it's fun to have Don Mancini back at the helm because you can get sort of more of the essence of this world that he sort of created. And uh, once you hear that Brad Dourif laugh as Charles Lee, any of the bad things that you think may be happening in this episode sort of go away. And you're like, look. Show's weird. It's silly. Uh, we get some. We have a lot of disbelief, but it's Chucky, and he's back, and uh, I'm here for the ride. So, what did you guys think about the first episode of Chucky? New episode, new series on Sci-Fi and USA, sort of a co co show. Go ahead and leave your thoughts and comments in the comments below. If you haven't already, you can follow us on Twitter at Hollywood ADI, or you can hit us up on email at HollywoodRDidit at gmail.com. We also have a podcast by the same name. It's on Google Podcasts, Spotify, Apple Podcasts. Anyway, that plays podcasts. We're there. Uh, I am curious. What is your favorite Child's Play film uh, so far? Go ahead and leave your comments in the comments below. Like always, I got my ticket. You got yours.